Hey, 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 we're going live. Going live with Temple, Triple A S, Africology. I am waiting for my guests. All right, here we go. Go live. Hey, everybody. We're waiting for my guest to join. Ms. Dr. Ife Tayo Flannery. Hey, hey what's happening, sis? How you be? Okay. This is good stuff. You looking good. Thank you. You too. You too. I, I ain't got the I ain't got the whole library layout in the background, but you, <laughs> you, but, you, but, you but you've been up in the lab, so you know what's up. I'm in the lab. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Okay. So people was getting on here quick. So we already got nine people. Um but we can probably wait a little bit. Okay. Yeah. But anyways, welcome. My name is Dr. Ife Tayo Flannery. I'm an assistant professor at San Francisco State University in the Africana Studies Department. And our guest today is Dr. Adisa. Would you like to let us know who you yeah, are? Yeah, I'm uh, Dr. Adisa Ajamu. I'm the director, the founding director for the Center for Black Culture, Resources, and Research at University of California, Irvine. And the Ife Tayo's friend. Yes. Which, which, which is an important distinction <laughs> to make. Most important part of the introduction, <laughs> my comrade, my friend, and colleague. Um, so we're live on this new IG series called um, Afri Africology Lit Series, which is hella dope. Um, Africology at Temple University, Department of Africology. So that's why we're here. I'm an alumni of the Department of Africology at Temple University, and I'm here to Chop it up with my Chop. good friend and colleague, Dr. Adi Sai, um, because we both have taken up black psychology and from mm -hmm. different angles, and but for similar reasons. So right. we want to talk about that today and keep it live. Welcome, IG. And even though I'm really savvy on the screen, this is honestly um, one of my first times using IG. So I think this should go good anyways. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we well, you know, we're just going to depend, depend like we sitting in my yeah. living room, sitting in my living room, chopping <laughs> it up. So it's all good. How are you feeling over there? Um, I'm in Oakland, California. Where are you at? I'm in Los Angeles. I'm, you know, I'm just living my version of Groundhog Day up in this piece. You know, like every, <laughs> for real. Like every day, feel like it's, you know, every day feel like it's Wednesday. So I tell people like we stuck in perpetual Wednesday up in this joint, but, oh. um, you know, perpetual Wednesday. Okay, so we got LA and Oakland in the house. So, y'all know it's the middle of the day for us. It's 3 p.m., although most of y'all out there is probably East Coast time, 6 p.m. So, holla at you. Um, so, I guess we could start getting started, mm -hmm. right? Yep, let's make it happen. Let's get it popping. First of all, for all y'all litty people who are following Black Studies on a Monday night, you're the bomb, you know. So <laughs> uh, we out here, you know, people trying to stay woke in a time such as now or especially now. And a lot of that, I think that conversation, I wonder what you think too, um, Dr. Adisa. A lot of this conversation about wokeness, even though it's a social concept, is pretty much a way for people to identify a level of black consciousness in a colloquial and easily identifiable way. Like it is the people's way of assessing, you know, our consciousness. And so I wonder what you think about that and maybe like, you know, how we can utilize it in the best way. I think it's an interesting and progressive tool. What do you think? So uh, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a point here in which when you, when the idea is introduced, that it, it uh, obviously it has the most integrity, right? And, and the more popular appeal it, it gets, the more the integrity of the idea um, gets stretched, right? So that, that what was originally intended um, doesn't hold the same integrity, right? So back in the, in the late 60s and early 70s, we talked about having a black consciousness, right? It was really around 
a notion of sort of a black, an African awareness, uh, a sense of how you move through the world. But as it becomes part of the popular culture dynamic, you know, it became part of everything. So everything became, you know, a, a, a conscious thing, right? So, you know, no, no matter whether or not it actually fit in with the original concept, right? I remember when, you know, in, in the in the mid eighties when Afrocentricity was coming about, right? There were, you know, a good example of this was there was actually a porn production company called Afrocentric Production, right? Which is like, so it's this idea of that you start with the idea of centering things in an African reality, which is like, you know, uh, Dr. Sante's notion of location theory, right? You're centering everything in African reality, but then as it, as it moves out and proliferates, people just apply it in a whole different, whole lot of other ways. So it became, right. so Afrocentric became folks who are pro-Black or or uh, anybody who was like, you were a black capitalist, you were doing business, that became Afrocentric. So woke is just the, um, a variation of that. My, 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 my larger concern about this whole wokeness movement is that we, you know, social media has changed the landscape so, somewhat so that we are, we bec we're becoming a people that, that, that like to know, but don't like to learn. Mm -hmm. And and that's the, that's part of the challenge here. So so uh oh, we, you gotta slow that down. What does it mean to like to know but not to learn? So we 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 see knowledge as a a product, as a, a way of demonstration, but learning is all of the things that go behind the scenes that make the product possible, right? And so what people want, you know, in our society, what people most want is to be seen. So it's good to get information from a YouTube video because you can then reproduce that information as a, as a commodity in a chat group or in a conversation. But it's not sexy seeing somebody going through archives <laughs> and pulling up information, right? So the, so the process of learning, the process of knowledge acquisition is, is disregarded in pursuit of just being the knower. And so you have, so you'll have folks on, on, in chat groups and on YouTube who are debating literally what they heard on another YouTube video without any appreciation for the knowledge, the work and the knowledge that went into acquire or the learn that went into acquiring that knowledge. So, you know, so that's where we are, that's where we are right now, where we have the people who really appreciate the idea that they, they can be a knower without ever having to actually learn. So I think that's part of what part of it ties into the whole wokeness thing, because you can actually be woke with, and still be asleep. Like learning a requirement to be known as a woke person. Uh, well, to me, the, the to me, uh, wokeness in our in our contemporary conversation just means to have um, uh, a, a limited awareness of something, right? So your idea, so you, so you can say, okay, we should defund the police and folks like you woke, but you don't know any you don't know anything about what the strategies are behind defunding police. You can't. You're not making a distinction between defund and um, the abolition of the of the law enforcement system. You just given the because you have mastered some terms and some concepts. That's enough for you to be woke. Oh, okay. So I feel you. What you're saying is like woke, although is while it's easy to use, it's also simplistic. Right. It's basically, our expectations. But nonetheless, I think it's a very important tool. But I do feel you on the like people wanting to know without wanting to learn. Uh, however. Um, I think the more one knows is basically the process of becoming conscious and, you know, and all the efforts of people like Marcus Garvey and W.E.B. Du Bois and all these folks, um, they knew they wasn't going to read a stack of books. Mm. That's not everyone's occupation. Right. But the idea of buy-in, I think, becomes important with wokeness and social movements. So, I mean, to that degree, I'm like, the mass awakening. Let's do this. But <laughs> but 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 but, but, here, but here's the for me here's the um, point because then the strategy of what to do with the wokeness and the social organizing is then the problem, right? Right. That, which is where I was going to, right? Because all consciousness is is technically to be with knowledge. Right? Uh -huh. You still got to you still got to be applied, and that's the and that's and, and I think that you know all too often we are we are satisfied with the idea of being woke. Now, you know, the, the analogy I use is that you, you know, the alarm clock goes off, you wake up, you woke, you lay in the bed, but, but, but you don't get up. You don't get up and do nothing. You woke, right? Uh, you don't get up and do anything. And, that, and, 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 and my, my argument is that for a lot of us, in fact, for too many of us, wokeness is just the fact that, I, that I'm up, but I'm sitting up in the bed, but I haven't got out of the bed to actually do anything. 
Okay. And we have to we have to find ways with love and compassion to find ways to inspire folks to get up out of the bed and to do. That's right. that's how that's how we win. Is that's our job? Yeah. So okay. Let me um transition into some other questions. Another question I think that'll be fruitful for anyone who's listening and shout out to everyone who's just joined recently with uh, Dr. Ife and Dr. Adi Sa. We out here in California on this IG Lit series. One of the things I want to get to to transition to a more interpersonal um, and I think we've had this conversation before and it was really, really interesting for me. So I wanted to ask you uh, while we're live, you know, you're a black man in Southern California. What was it that led you into black psychology like why black psychology and how did you get there yeah so i always tell people so i had uh, the good fortune of uh being at irvine at the time that uh dr thomas parham was there and um at the time i, I, you know, I was playing basketball I was on basketball scholarship so i wasn't necessarily interested in anything academic you know i was trying to chase balls and chase skirts so that was pretty much that was pretty much my agenda and Dr. P, Dr. P was the one who pulled me up and said, look, bro, you know, you got too much talent to be wasting just chasing balls and skirts. You should come work work with me. And I'm like, man, nah, I'm good on that. Like life is, I'm, I'm living the life here as, a, as an undergraduate basketball player. It's all for the good. So eventually uh, I came to him and I asked him, so I said, man, you know, I mean, you, you drive a nice ride. Your wife is fine. Don't seem like you work that. You're for real. I, I could, I'm from the hood, right? So I just came right here. I like, you know, it don't seem like you work that hard. What is it that you do? <laughs> and he was like, he was like, yo, he said, I'm a psychologist. I'm like, shit, well, that's what I want to be. So, people, so, so people ask like, why did you become a psychologist? I was like, because Dr. P was a psychologist. He's been a botanist. We've been here talking about the secret life of plants. I mean, it's kind of, it's kind of that simple. It was just that I could see a, a pathway through him, and then from him, he introduced me to Dr. Nobles, and then the rest is just history. You know, I just, I fell in love with a way of understanding our people that. I didn't see in any of the other disciplines and uh, that I could in real time see the world that I lived in, you know, that, cause I'm from, I'm from the South Bronx in South Central Los Angeles, so I'm from the cut, from the hood. So what I was seeing in classrooms didn't reflect the reality that I grew up in. And right. so a black psychology really sort of gave me a prism to see the world through a lens that made sense to me and a way of, of sort of understanding and interpreting the reality of black folks and from that point on I was hooked mm. yeah I like that story um because I think you know it goes untold kind of the way in which um black people become socialized into certain things and it's not this whole like um free liberal idea of um necessarily like you know I always dreamed of being a poet or something mm -hmm. I you know and this is where apprenticeship comes in it really does come down to I think um mentorship and actually seeing people who are modeling the life you want to live that's very much similar to my story how I got into Africana studies and I like to tell this story because I feel like it helps me to identify with the students especially in intro to Africana or intro to anything black studies like my major was biology when I entered Georgia State, and I had no intention of working with people. I was turned off by people already at the age of 18, okay? I was in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was like, I think I'm going to go work with, you know, animals and plant science. So uh, I randomly got into an intro to Black studies class because a counselor was, a Black woman actually was like, you need to take it. I was like, fine. And I was so shook. I went through the woke process. Mm -hmm. that um, I couldn't forget, I couldn't unremember the things that had already begun to alter my reality. And so that's another thing I think, this is how you know if you're really educated. I think if you're really being educated and if you're being afforded the tools that you deserve. And I tell students to be mindful of this. If you're taking classes and you're paying for things and they haven't... Um, afforded you the inspiration to want to rethink the way you thought about something fundamentally, then you probably haven't engaged in the actual learning experience yet. You've engaged mm -hmm. a period of observation of, of whatever frivolous things. But the difference between white studies and black studies was that it fundamentally forced me to shift 
the way I viewed the entire world, not just like a period of history. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that black psychology has tried to integrate into this sort of space that we call um, social analytics. I don't mm -hmm. know. Um, and understanding like human behavior. Yeah, so so I you know so I think that you know part of the 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 challenge for us is, is I think to recognize that the one that the majority of our genius does not exist on college campuses, right? That that uh, that that college campuses are really sort of a, a separator system for folks who have a certain kind of intelligence that fits well within the social framework of white misanthropy or what some people call white supremacy. So you know there are all these benchmarks that that determine who gets to who gets to go who doesn't, and what 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 you what we find is that those of us who end up getting into the academy have to find ways to narrow our interests to fit within the confines of what Europeans think is important. So it means that most of the time we're taking classes that don't really reflect the reality that we wish to exist in, but they reflect our ability to be able to move up the socioeconomic ladder. So. Right. So it's always so it's always, it's always sort of that tension, and and what Black Studies did, as you know better than I do, is that they really brought back the whole idea of the of the of the university being a community university, right? Like that it was really about us taking what we had learned in these spaces and bringing them back to the community. That was that was its strength. That's what what drove Black Studies in San Francisco State and had made it for the longest time. Really like the hub because of that that kind of community based kind of model. And you're right, like you know so. If you're not in spaces that challenge you to think, which is most of the spaces on college campuses, they, they, that, that people are people are not educated, they are trained. That's and, right. And our challenge is to you know sort of uh, assist them in a in, in a in an awakening process, which is why Black Studies is important because for some campuses that's the only place where that will happen for Black folks. Absolutely. Literally, you know. So. And I find it interesting because I know you um um got your PhD at Howard, and I got uh, mine's at the black part of the university at Temple University. <laughs> and um, one of the interesting things that I like to remind people is that um, I double majored in psychology, white psychology um, to be specific. And the black psychologists in just the last 50 years are very prolific. And when I say we didn't read not a mere one, in white psychology, which led me to believe that there is an intentional effort to obscure and, and to subverse the uh, emerging uh, and really the field that is, is, is black psychology now, insofar as it's not recognized by white psychology as legitimate. Where I learned anything and everything about the major black psychologists that we know today, dear to our hearts, like Kobe Kim Bond, Dr. Wade Nobles, Marimba Adni, all these people, Naeem Akbar, is through Black Studies classes. Right. And I think that relationship needs to be um, more forthright. Um, I don't know if it's acknowledged in terms of the link between the actual paradigms and philosophical assumptions that come out of Black Studies is mirrored and extended um, in Black psychology in ways that white psychology will never, never, never mm -hmm. acknowledge um, the, the work of black psychologists who have intentionally made themselves separate from APA. Um, but what's your experience? Because you, you have gone through um, a more traditional route of psychology, but you did have like all these black mentors around. Mm -hmm. Like what's the, is there a tension? Um, well, well, so, so for me, there's not a tension because my, because my, my focus is always about like how we get black people free. So I don't have any allegiance to a discipline. I, I don't care about psychology. <laughs> I, yeah. I care about I care about black people, and I think that you know, one of the challenges we have, even you know, in, in our work, is that sometimes we're so busy trying to defend our discipline and our guild that we forget that the reason that the guild exists is to defend black people, and that you know, and that if the choice is if the choice is for me, psychology or black people is always going to be black people, and that there's a point where you know. You know, there's a there, you, you talk about this convergence between uh, black psychology and, and black studies, but really, you know, but it's always been there from the from the beginning, right? Because they were they were all drinking from the same sort of well of knowledge, you know, the Harlem History Negro Club and John G. Jackson and Chancellor Williams and John Henry Clark and Charles C. McIntyre, all those. So they were so so that school of thought was informing 
both the discipline of black studies and black psychology and some of the pioneers in the area of black psychology started in in black studies right dr knows being one of them who's you know whose entire academic career was largely in black studies and you know so there's a point in which both of these things have kind of grown up together yeah and, and they've had know, to, insofar yeah. as their mission was to disenfranchise the white production of knowledge that distorted right. how we understand black people in the world and to to really empower black folks um which is a really stated difference it sounds so simplistic but the reality of, I think the higher up you go in higher ed, and you can give me your feedback, the the more white supremacy um, you're indoctrinated with. Because um, a lot of times I feel like people focus on um, TV, media, movies, uh, visuals, like what's on the magazines. But the people who are most learned at white supremacy are very, very educated. Mm -hmm. And I just remember being in school, and I was at that juncture where I could even... Um, I could go terminal in white psychology or keep going Africana studies and people would be like, well, why did you end up in Africana studies? And I remember um, being in certain classes and being like, I didn't want to become an expert at European science. Mm -hmm. And that was like a transition for me. Like, what are we here to use our destiny for, to use our, to use our gifts for like, what has the divine, you know, what's the divine purpose of the accessibility we have to empower ourselves? And it's a lot of, it's a decision that people have had to make for years. Um, people have been isolated, Black people in other fields, because they've decided to, you know, focus on Black empowerment instead of building the disciplines, as you say. So. Yeah, but you, but, but, but I think you bring a, a point here that, that I think is, is, is worth going into further, which is that no part of our education is about, it, it has been divorced of white supremacy and misanthropy from pre-K through graduate school. It's all, all of that is. So, so by the time you step into the conversation about doing anything for black folks, you've got what, 16 years or more of education indoctrination into a European system. And what, and what we see with that is also a psychological investment in that knowledge. So most of the time, what I see is not really that people are doing work that I would call authentically of African-centered work or authentically African-centered psychology. What I see them doing is European psychology that they, they threw kente cloth on, right? So a lot of the a lot of the the stuff that we talk about in terms of like black psychology is basically that people just do kente cloth on or Freud and Adler gave them a little kufi and an ankh. But you didn't fundamentally change the the fundamental epistemological assumption right. about about what you know. For us, the question still is: What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be a spirit? Uh, what is the knowledge of that? Like these are all different assumptions than the assumptions that drive Western psychology. You can't just put you can't just put Kente cloth on that and be like that's African. You got to engage our systems, our ways, our our ways of knowledge, and that moves us out of the concept. You know, when you go to graduate school, you are trained. It's your responsibility to educate yourself, and that's the part. So we get so when we get these degrees. All they're saying is that we have been trained. The question is, what did we do within the context of that program that that allowed us to be educated in a way that put us in positions to actually advance the image and interests of African people? And I think yeah. that's how you. I think that's how you get an Ipe Tayo. You know, <laughs> I think that's how you get a Greg Carr. Uh, you get an Yelly, a Jared Ball. Is that at some right. point down the line, folks just decide that okay, I've been trained, but my job in this process is also to be educated. What do you think, um, bringing back to like the sort of the mass, the mass level, let's say people specifically in the United States right now, what do you think um, is most positively affecting the, the collective black conscious and probably most negatively affecting our collective black consciousness today? Right, so Here's the challenge that we face. Institutions reproduce consciousness, right? Not, not, lecture, not lecture programs, not, you know, institutions reproduce consciousness. You don't believe me, most people, look at how people are dressing at home that now they don't have to go into the office. The office as an institution shapes your consciousness about what is appropriate to where to work and not where to work, right? What is appropriate, it, it shapes your way of thinking about the work you do. 
Harvard produces a certain kind of student year in and year out, regardless of what decade it's in, because institutions reproduce consciousness. And our problem is that we have taken on the whole idea of wokeness as a as a as an as an individual experience as opposed to a collective experience that is buoyed by institutions. So family, family is, is, a, is a critical institution that reproduces consciousness, schools, religious institutions, families, social groups. And so part of, of the challenge for us is that how do we, we get back into the business of institution building as opposed to just branding ourselves, right? So everybody want to be a brand now, which is kind of idiotic given our history in this country where we were literally branded when we arrived on these slave vessels. So the question becomes for us, how do we build institutions? Where are our think tanks? All right, well, all the Zoom technology, we should be able to have think tanks. We don't have to be in the same places now. We can do things. So we need to be able to be in a space where we build, like what Malefi did at Temple is great. It's historic. But those of us also need to figure out how we build those kinds, replicate those kinds of institutions outside of the apparatus of a temple. Um, how do we find ways to, 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 to heal the rift between Black men and Black women? Because that's a critical institution that needs to be repaired. How do we get our, our religious institutions to actually hold faith with the faith that they say they hold? That's, you know, th those are all of the challenges that are, that, are in, that are in front of us. And I think that, you know, part of what we can do as scholars and as thinkers is to try and inspire people, to point them in, in the right direction, to listen to them and allow them to point us into directions too. And but all with the focus on how we build institutions. Okay, I'm feeling that institutions reproduce consciousness you know i agree with that wholeheartedly wholeheartedly in terms of the idea that consciousness back to your point is is more than the individual which is where we surpass western psychology already the idea of the individual being the domain and the beginning and the alpha and mm -hmm. omega um because to be honest anyways you can't participate in a certain level of reality by yourself like reality right. is you know, people participating in shared beliefs and so on, which we later call culture, but I still call that consciousness. Um, and so I'm with you on that. I've been thinking a lot, like, uh, with a lot of changes that people have been experiencing in 2020 and people trying to come to a reckoning of, you know, what to do once the energy of masses amounts of people starts to really boil. Uh, what's going to happen? And sometimes we anticipate greatness and sometimes we anticipate like nothingness. It's like this right. pure system and very rarely do we just make strategic and achievable goals out of those, those moments. Right? So I think that's also up to folks and people on black Twitters and everything, which is uh, basically a, 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 a atmosphere of consciousness in and of itself, you know, a stratosphere of that anyways is, is achievable goals that that's what helped me to become a learned person anyways is to not trick myself into thinking that i'm going to radically change overnight and so therefore if i can't do that i wouldn't put that on a community of people that's an unrealistic expectation right. and so that's that's usually my go-to too if i take away if you can't change certain things about yourself don't shame people uh mm -hmm. for that about themselves especially when you start talking about group dynamics the most hardest people and i'm using ebonics intentionally because i'm comfortable there the most hardest people to change is your own family right <laughs> so right, right solution that's real work that's not something that's like oh whatever but i'm a community worker but i don't talk to none of the people in my family as a black psychologist as an africologist the real work starts at home and that's actually a very arduous task but that's where you reproduce things um so, so here's the way I think uh psychology can be helpful is that we can we can provide folks with the lens so they can clarify um sometimes errors in thinking that get in the way of them making the change they wish to make. And one of those errors in thinking is that we confuse attitudes with behaviors. So you read a book and you say that book changed your life. Well, no, it didn't. It changed your attitude about something. It's what you it's what you do with that information going forward in a, in an applied way that will result in a change in your life, and so because we only focus on the change in attitude and not the the corresponding or necessary corresponding change in behavior, we end up with a situation where we say okay we got all these people awoke their attitude is woke their mm. behavior is not 
I like so, that. So, so you so you can have a whole bunch of folks who have changed their attitude mm -hmm. and still be comfortable on the plantation because they haven't funded the things that would free them. So I think that here's a point where you know right. psychologists can say, look, yeah, I, you you read this book and I'm glad you amped and it got you all fired up, but what did you do with that? Right? You know, that's the that's the that's the that's where you find the, the real work. And the other part is just, you know, if I might just to, to um to sort of like share for our audience how some of these things work. In uh in psychology there's a thing we call the aperceptive field. And the aperceptive field is everything that's available in your sensate stimuli is available in your environment at any given time. And that's usually about about a billion things that since they stimulate in your environment any given time. The brain can't process all of that. So what it does, if it did, it would it would do what your computer does. You give your computer too many commands and that little wheel starts spiraling. Your brain would do this. What your brain does is organize the information into themes or what we call thematic a perception. So if you if I decide tomorrow I want to buy a, a, a Land Rover Velar, and all of a sudden I'm seeing Land Rover Velars all over the place. And I'm saying, look, that's God telling me or the ancestors are telling me this will be my car. No, it's your brain has decided to organize. You've given your brain some messages, your consciousness some messages about how to organize information to, to attend to what it is that you think is important. And, and instead, they've done studies like this where they've asked folks to look for a particular car and then tell them how many times they saw the car during the day. And students will be like, I saw, the, I saw this Range Rover like 70 times. And they say, okay, well, can you name one other car you saw? And they're like, nah, I don't, I don't remember any other car. Because not only does it, does it, change what you see it also changes what you don't see and so the reason why this is important is because if all your programming is about black people being inferior black folks being backward black folks will never you know you do business with them it ain't never right what happens is you only attend to those examples that prove the point but you're completely blind to all of the examples that prove that that's that's a that's an that's an error that's a marginal moment as opposed to the larger thing so when we talk about, you know, black folks can't never work together, or that's because we've been there have been messages given to us that have shaped how we see one another. Mm. And it's our and it's our job as thinkers and healers to say, look, let's try and find ways to expand the the, the thematic a perception so that you invite into the into your vision right. all the other examples. And I think that's part of the problem. So if we're looking for folks who are woke, we will we will see that, but we won't see all of the examples of folks who are woke but are not doing anything. So I think that it's important to you know, sort of un unpack that. That's a good one. I think that goes back to the point of having a, a decolonial um, education system, right? And not just learning more, but learning correctly. Mm. There's a difference um, that can be confused there, um, especially with the sensory information and the constant feed of information. I think that's really potent now, what you said right. about your brain starts to organize so that you continue to see things insofar as we're seeing more information on a regular basis than we ever have in human history. Um, mm -hmm. Something that makes me think about also is um, back to the point of like, so what will we do with what we know? And I think about um, human history. I think about the history of the African diaspora and there's certain like landmark moments that we like to to highlight as like these were moments where we had revolution or rebellion or a heightened consciousness. And oh, you know, people got comfortable, whatever, it went away, black power went away, or the Haitian Revolution, the energy of it died, et cetera. And so once we have access to power, whether that's intellectual, spiritual, a certain level of consciousness to your point about the difference between attitude and behavior is what will we do with it? And I think that deserves a lot of work as well, because a lot of our attention in the facilities that we work with and in just social media in general is the, the benchmark of, you know, something, right. but not how to manufacture that into something. It makes me think like, like, um, in um, African traditional religions, um, sometimes people go through these decolonial and really like epistemological changes and orientation to the world compared to like Christianity and Islam. But then you get into those religions and then the only thing you're praying for is like a man and a house and stuff like that. Like right. the same things you was doing before. And so if you have access to a greater power that's like 
associated with the movement of the entire universe. What are you going to ask for? And I think it's frazzling to me in the day of now where everyone's talking about healing and self-care. And then, you know, you're only praying for like money in a new house. It's like healing means ancestral healing insofar mm-hmm. as your ancestors were money. And now you're praying mm-hmm. for money. Like yeah. they were changed as capital. So a sum of that, that has to be really, I think to your point about wokeness, there's so much that has to, there's a lot of work that goes into that. Like, who do we, who do we look to, to help us with that? So, so as usual, like, you know, I, I, if, if folk could be a fly on the wall in, in our conversation here, yeah, when we were doing our little writer's retreat, <laughs> and, and, and we start on a riff and then the three o'clock in the morning someplace else. So the, the, the for me, the, the, there's a couple of things here that you really pointed out that I think are, are worth um, delving into deeper. One of them is, what are our values as a people, right? right? Because again, wokeness don't mean anything if it's not there aren't values that 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 it has to line up against. And we're in a space where like anything goes, right? And so at some point, like so, so part of it is values, and part of it is then the the next level is how do your actions align with your values? So you say you value these things, right? Do your actions, my, my, my good friend uh, and God brother, Dr. Anthony Smith has always asked this question of his, of his, of his clients, like, how are your, your actions aligning with your expressed values, right? Because that, that, that makes each person accountable for their own social contract with themselves. If I say I value black women, but I'm disrespecting them, then again, I got to say, okay, well, how, how, do you, how does this value align with your actions? And I think that's a that's a, a question we have to ask one another. I also think that there's a, a a larger question here that I don't think we can really fully unpack here, which is the ways in which we appropriate terms because they are popular and they put us in the spotlight, even though the term we've appropriated don't have any correlation to the actual concept. And I'm speaking here of the concept of healers, right? Everybody done ran up on the healer thing. But you ain't doing no healing, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or you, or we're not even having a conversation about healing. So for me, most of what we call healing is what 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 I would call palliative care, meaning it's pain management. It's not healing. So even in, in even in the psychological realm, what we're really doing is we're helping Black people figure out how to live with the pain of mm-hmm. white supremacy and misanthropy. We're mm-hmm. not how to deal with the trauma of sexual abuse and so on. So but we're not actually healing them, because healing is about restoration to a form of wholeness, right? If my arm mm-hmm. breaks and you said it and it's still broken, but I, I got range of motion, you didn't heal me. You know, you get as palliative care. I'm able to, to manage the pain and still function, but the break is still there. Healing has to do with restoration. And the, the, the challenge that we have is that we are so hell bent on being seen that it gets in the way of the work of healing. And one of the things that, you know, you know, in, in, in African spiritual systems is that the silence is as powerful as the, as the spoken word. What happens in the shadows is as important what happens in the sunlight, that, that a, lot of, a, a lot of things lose their potency when they become too public. And we in this whole thing, so everybody, you know, so if you're in tradition, you got all your pots and, and all your shrines and stuff up on Instagram and Facebook and that. The power of those systems is in the, the fact that there is a certain esoteric relationship between you and those things that, that get lost when, when, you, when you put them in direct light, so to speak. But because we are so focused on being how, we, how it looks to be a healer, that we're not asking the questions about how, one, how does one have to line up their lives, their attitudes, their behaviors, their actions and their values so that they are an instrument for healing and not an instrument for the propagation of the notion of being a healer. And that's part of the, you know, the challenge because again, you know, there, 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 is, there is work to be done here, but it's not, you can't do that work in sunlight. Every therapist knows you can't show your whole, your, your, you meet with a client and, you, and that was broadcast on IG Live, that, changed, that distorts the whole process. The, very, the client therapist relationship works because it's between two people in the confines of sacred space where things can happen. And that's part of our challenge. Like everybody, we live in a society where everybody wants to be seen. And yeah. it's compromising our ability to actually do the work in the way that the work needs to be done. Mm-hmm. 
You've been, uh, and by the way, uh, IG folks, you can leave us some questions in the chat too as we're having this ongoing conversation. But uh, Dr. I decided you've been leaving us with all these gems, like um, changing your behavior versus your attitude and um, healing versus pain management. These things are standing out to me. Um, you uh, were one of the authors of this book, The Psychology of Blacks, that came out a while yeah. back. Kind of a yeah, was, yeah. What? See, this was published here in... Um, I was a graduate student when that, when that edition came out. Right in 2000? Yeah. Uh, or 19. It was published a few times. Yeah. There's like a, a lot of times there's like a waves we see in um in black consciousness and in the efforts that people were willing to do together as mm -hmm. opposed to individually. What was something that um really inspired creating a text such as this at that time? So this just keeping it real with you. I mean, as a graduate student, it was like, yo, um, what really made me excited about that writing that book was that my father, who was an ex-convict, uh, he's an ancestor now, had never went past the third grade. Um, I got to write the acknowledgement, and it meant that that book was going to be in libraries all around the country. And so, you know, and part of my acknowledgement was was recognizing my mother and father and the sacrifices they had made. And what really drove what, what I was excited about was that my father, who had never stepped on the college campus except to drop me off for school, and had never really. So his name would be in a book that would be in institutions of higher learning all around the country. That was the, that was the, that was the primary thing. And then the next thing was just as a young person, like, yo, you, you know, you're getting your name out there, you know? So it was, it was, so a lot of it was very sort of um, self-interested. And then you know, when I started uh, getting the reaction and the response from folks who read the book, then I realized that, you know, it was having an impact far beyond the fact that, you know, my own personal, moment of pride and, and the fact that you know both Dr. White and, and, and Dr. Parham. So the book, uh, the first edition was written by Dr. White. The second edition, Dr. White brought on his student, Dr. Parham. The third edition, Dr. Parham following tradition brought on his young apprentice, which was me. Mm -hmm. and, and, then, uh, and, then we, and then we did a fourth edition, uh, which I went from being the third author to the second author. Um, which was, you know, which, which was, uh, which was, because by then I was, I was, you know, I was a scholar in my own right, and um, and I liked the. If I had to say anything that I was really disappointed, I think we, we fought very hard for this. Was that I wish the book would have been published as a trade publication, because it was published as an academic text, and it made it the price point made it out of the reach of most working day black folks. So if I, you know, we do okay, I think I would do it as a as a trade publication so that it would, the price point would be lower and more people have access to it but anybody right. who's listening to anybody who's listening uh, who has joined us today if you email me at atunwa at gmail.com I'll send you a pdf of, of the book for free so um, you know that, that's, that's, that's my way of that's my way of uh, even in the scales and, and uh, the residuals have you know the, resi the, the, the residuals have been they have been good to me so far so I, I'm I'm you know, I feel good about, you know, actually sharing, you know, sharing that. But I did want to sort of return back to this thing about healing, because I, I think that there is, um, you and I have talked about this in our private space, there is a space now here for uh, that we're seeing Black women, um, or we'll call the sacred feminine, sort of in the ascendant, or sort of in the rise. And I'm excited about that. I'm excited about what that means in terms of how that will enliven our understanding of what it means to be to heal, to be whole, to think about, you know, um, reclaiming ourselves and the idea of, of restoration to ourselves. So I was just interested to know that as, as, a, as a Black woman, as a scholar, and as w watching this rise, this ascendancy of, of the sacred feminine, how that has shaped your, your, your attitudes and your behaviors about our, our struggle. Oh, wow, that's a good question. It's like both intimate and philosophical. <laughs> The IGs. <laughs> you know, um, I've been thinking about this a lot. And even as a young woman, I feel, I guess I'm young, I'm in my mid-30s. I feel a particular type of pressure um, to do everything correctly. And I say that because just like in any, in any role where there's an expectation, mere visibility does not get the job done. 
And so I think with the voice and the visibility and the, um, the impact that Black women are having, and not just that they're having, they've always had, but that people are actually willing to accept that there also comes a particular responsibility if you're um, in a position to shape families and societies. And, um, and so I think about that a lot. Um, it's made me actually um, do a lot of uh, character development personally, to be more patient, to be more um, listening, to be more um, uh, yielding almost. Mm -hmm. Um, I think sometimes um, if we use sort of a Eurocentric understanding of power, it is power is for dominance, for domain, for domestication of others, um, to yield profit and, and attention. But I think if we, we took the best of our best of our ancestors and how we watch people develop civilizations, I think the Black woman's role insofar as she's acquiring more and more power is mm -hmm. to also do... Um, the most amount of self-development and healing one can insofar as people are looking to you um, as the well of wisdom. Mm -hmm. And so with that attention and with that underscore of voice, there comes a level of responsibility. And that's actually made me a better person. Um, I think sometimes when you get um, folks who have never had a voice before to have a voice, sometimes, um, they don't have a community, they have a voice without a community, and that can, that can actually feel painful. So there's also a, a, a disillusionment that now that people are willing to listen to Black women, so a lot of Black women are still angry because no one's actually listening to them. Mm -hmm. But I think when you yield power, that's where the, or you, you know, what are you saying that's worth listening to? And I would say that to anyone, regardless of their gender, mm -hmm. what are you right. saying that's worth listening to? Right. And, important to not step into a place of power um, to, in order to um, destroy others, but in order to essentially, and this is what the divine feminine has really done, is to make us better, is to make us more whole. And mm -hmm. we have to defer to things such as this. It's our, it's our role to be wise, and it's our role to be organized. That's going to be my tag. <laughs> Why is it organized? Um, so these are some things I think about. What about what about you and your interactions um, with Black women? So 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 I I, um, I don't want to lose sight of, of of something else that you said that I think is really um, poignant. So I don't want I don't want to do that to address that first. You you talked about the question of voice, and I think that 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 that's really uh, uh, a critical conversation to ha be had, right? So when, if you think about voice, when you speak from the back of your throat, you project one way. When you speak from your diaphragm or your, or your lower center of gravity, you project more force of voice. And I think that there, there's, a, there's a good analogy there about when we speak from the core of ourselves, we speak with power and force. And when we speak from the back of our, our throats, we're really just, we're blowing air, but we're not, pulling, we're not generating power or transformative force. And I think that the, the same thing can be, can be said in, in terms of, of the world, that, that there, are, there are those of us who are in positions to, get, to stand from microphones who speak from the back of their throats. And there are those of us who have the ability to be able to not, without even the microphone, where they, because they project from the center of themselves, they be they're able to be heard no matter where they speak from or you know wherever wherever location they're speaking from, and I think that in this instance, black women have a certain access to a certain a force of voice, if you will, and and that force of voice is exerting is exerting its will in ways that are both physical and metaphysical, you know my you know it so it so in, in reference to me and my relationship with black women is one, you know, to recognize that I step into every conversation knowing that even though I think I'm a progressive cat, I still got, you know, patriarchy is still part of me because that's been how I've been raised. And to try and find ways to listen more, to get out the way, to recognize when it's important for me to hold space, 
and when it's important for me to to make the space safe by remo removing myself from it because you know so there there are a variety of ways um i think that you know just being candid i think that that brothers have a um have an easier time in doing those things in platonic relationships with black women and in social relationships with black women they do in in intimate relationships with black women and um you know, and that's always like that's it always comes back to this question about like action and and values and and actions, right? And sometimes, as you mentioned, like the the places closest to home are the places where it's harder for, hardest for us to actually effectuate that kind of change. And so, for me, you know, one of the challenges has always been like I, I'm I've always been good at like you know good working relationships with women, the women who work with me, the women who work for me, my friends. But I haven't always had that that same level of integrity or intensity in dealing with my amorous relationships, right? And so part of the, the work that I you know, started even in my 30s was like, okay, how do I bring that in alignment so that that the relationship, the romantic relationship I have with women are actually pretty consistent with the relationships I have with women across the board. And I think that that's a challenge for a lot of brothers. Um, and it's a challenge for a lot of reasons that you know, go beyond this conversation. But I think that part of it is also, you know, knowing, knowing when to get out the way. Like, okay, look, this is not, you know, and fall back and let and and let sisters do what they need to do. Yeah. Um, I think that one of the main problems, and I'm glad you brought that up too, like there are differences in terms of um, interpersonal versus professional relationships and how people engage with Black women and in this sort of continuous conversation around healing and Black consciousness. I think I am one Black woman, but I'm surrounded by many. Um, that, And I say this as a person who is a leader. Um one major thing that can become a hurdle um, is delegation with mm -hmm. Black women. And I think because of the socialization and interpersonal relationships in the family home and the sort of adoption of uh, patriarchal structures that we're able to use for our family structures, where women will not delegate, okay, now you actually need to go do this. It's like, ah, I'll just do it myself to get it done. That actually rolls over into professional spaces, into spaces of corporate America and all other kind of things. And so where you simultaneously are seeing, oh, like that woman is so strong or she does so many things. It also is a burden um, mm -hmm. and it's a hardship. But I think there's uh, there's something that's really simple. And this is a practice of delegation. And I don't think people are used to receiving orders from black women. And I don't think women are used to giving them. But I think that would make the flow and the balance of power and the accessibility for healing for all people um, to be a little bit better. Um, and so, like, for example, in, um, let's say, in a regular relationship, even if it's just a friendship, um, a lot of times when I'm hearing people who um, come to me for counsel or whatever, um, sometimes women will have a grievance that, um, they find they're they attracted to the fact that men will want to confide in them, you know, it makes their love stronger and makes them feel special, but they're not attracted to the fact that they can't, um, talk about how bad their day was to their man. It's like mm -hmm. a one directional thing. And, and so it's like, well, who does the woman go to? Probably another woman. And so in, in this kind of like matrix of things where men come to women with grievances in a private sphere and then women have to go to other women. And then this, so there's a double carrying on, on the one side. And I think as we're thinking about leadership, visibility and stuff, I want to push back on men feeling like the best thing they can do is um, get out the way. We actually need you more, um, in my opinion. I need help. And that's yeah, so, what I would say. Yeah, so, so, so this, is, this, is, this is good. So um, what, I, what I would say is that, you know, Again, here's an area where psychology can 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 offer some illumination, right? So if we 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 understand that most people, when they have a difficult task, want help. That's a human response. The question is, what what is getting in the way of them asking for help or feeling like the, like the asking of the help is a sign of weakness, right? So we know the literature tells us that black people have what we call generally poor help-seeking behaviors, meaning that Black people in general will not ask for help, right? No matter how bad they're doing, I they will not ask for help. Don't want to ask. 
in general, in general, right? right? But but here's what here's what gets interesting. Black women of all groups, black women have the what we call the poorest help seeking behaviors, and here's why. Not only will black women not ask for help when they are drowning, they are more likely to offer help even as they are drowning. Mm -hmm. So, 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 the, so, the, so the burden is not so the burden is not just about the fact that they, they won't ask for help; is that they are also offering help while they are also going under. And so, what happens is that what ends up happening is that in that situation, you see the person who is, who is actually looking like they're in a position to help. So you don't offer the help because you see them helping everybody else. When in reality. That's a coping mechanism for the fact that they can't they can't stop themselves from drowning. So maybe they can help somebody else stop mm, from drowning. That's good. And so and so part of it is so if we understand that behavior, right? Like so, I have a mother and I have a younger sister. And part of and so understand that behavior is like I will I will ask them if they need help, but I will rephrase it in another way. I say, look, you know, I rather than ask them if they need help, like you know, I said I said to my mom, my mom came and stayed with me for uh, two weeks. So rather than saying to my mom, like, yo, you know, uh, come here because I want to make sure you, you know, I, I can watch you during this whole COVID-19 thing. I said, hey, mom, you know, it'd be really nice for us to spend some mother and son time together, you know, to build and the bond, which was all true. But how I presented to my mom, it, it was it was a strength based offer and not a, a, a deficit model offer. Yeah, so I, I wouldn't offer, I wouldn't say to the sister, can I help you? I would say, look, you know, this would be really a really great idea if, you know, we we worked on this together. So that so so that you're not putting the, per the person in a position of having to admit that they that they need help, but, but put them in a position to be able to accept it as an act of collaboration. And I think that it's really important if you so if you understand that that you know in my center I recommend all the time sisters come in, they're involved in all these leadership groups on campus, they run the sororities and BSU, you know, they won't ask for help. So usually what I would say to them is, hey, you know, I see you got X, Y, and Z. And I really, you know, I would enjoy doing this with you because I would learn more about the student. So is it okay if I work with you on this? And they'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden they delegate. They got no problem delegating. Mm -hmm. but, but, but as long as it's from, as long as the offer comes from a, 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 an assumption that they are weak or less than, of course they're not going to, you know, if I say, let me help you with this because I see you struggling. That's not, <laughs> that's not, that's not an invitation that you're going to want to embrace. <laughs> so that's what I'm. So, that, so that's what I'm saying. So that's what I'm saying that the, that the, that understanding that we have uh, poor help-seeking behaviors and understanding how it, it impacts Black women in a particular way allows us as Black men to to figure out what's the best way to offer support. Yeah, I, I like that. I think we can really put that to work and use that immediately. That's very good advice. Um, not disappearing and being like. I'm going to fall back or I'm going to silence myself so women can speak. But entering from a strength-based cooperative way, I think that, that actually ends up benefiting everybody. Yeah, um, but, but, but I also want to say this. There's, there's times when basically everybody in the room who's smarter than you is a sister. So you need to fall back. <laughs> like, right. like, 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 we don't, this is what's interesting. We don't, we don't, when it comes to men, we don't have, black women are, are okay if they're in a room with a bunch of men and the men are the experts are falling back, but the black men do. So sometimes you're in a room, like you and I have conversations. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a scholar of black studies. There are times when you and I are having conversations that I got, I need to be quiet because that ain't my expertise. I need to listen to you. So there's a, there's a part, but I, I understand your point about like saying, okay, look here, you know, you go ahead and you, you do all of the work. Getting that work yeah. done yeah. in the, my, my issue with, um, probably not delegating or seeing other women who are afraid to to um or who is going to support them we haven't had a good practice of that who supports black women consistently in a way that we can predict and rely upon that's usually other women um so there needs to be a, a different type of practice if the expectation is that now we have the space the power and the education to lead we need people to work with us um, and not to be like, oh, you you empowering? Okay, you got it. Right. You know, but I do understand your point with like, it, if you don't fall back, right? That's anybody. <laughs> yeah, but, but but here's the thing. Like, so so when I when I observe black women, the ways in which they offer help to one another, they don't ask if you need help. Black women don't ask; they just help, right? And that, and so part of it is also about like there's a there's a way in which black women hold space for one another that allow them to receive help because it's not offered as a, a, an admission of weakness, right? Like, so 
when my when my sister wasn't feeling well, folks didn't say, okay, look, you know, uh, do you need me to bring you food? Folks brought stuff over, right? Like that's just the, the, the way that you roll, right? You know, mm-hmm. and so there, so there's a, there's a so there's a reason why I think women, black women, take help from other black women because also it's how it's offered, you know, and 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 and, and the way in which it's offered that says this, here's a relationship that that I'm mm-hmm. I'm respecting in in assisting you. It's right. not because we, it's, it's, it's part of our contract in this relationship as friends, as sisters, that we move forward. And I think that that's part of the thing that gets lost in trans, because brothers do it for each other. Like, you know, if I know one of my boys is struggling, I'm going to slide him some change without him asking. But that gets lost in translation sometimes when we're dealing with black women. We don't bring that same kind of energy over. And I think that it's also, you know, um, if we could just take a moment to talk about this whole the strong black women thing. Because I think that, you know, and you know, you know, I've talked about this, about how, like, you know, that strength is a function of instrumentality, like, it, like how something is used or its ability to be used. That's what strength is. And maybe we need to change the conversation from uh, Black women being strong to Black women being powerful, because power is a function of force that allows it to exert, it, it imposes its will on a thing, right? We talk about our hurricanes in terms of force, Right, and its impact in terms of strength. So maybe the conversations that we need to have conversations with, with with little black girls about how they are powerful, right, as opposed to how they need to be strong, uh, because strong, uh, you know, a mule is strong, right. But the question is about how you how you generate force, and I think that that's part of the 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 conversation that we should be having, you know, with our with our young sisters about like you know you are powerful, and and that that. To be able to make the world will and your intent, and uh, and if we can change, you know, going back to the, how we started this, this, your point about consciousness, if we can change that attitude, so that folks start seeing themselves as powerful, then maybe we we eventually change the behavior. Mm, right, the attitude to the behavior, which is very important as well. Hmm. So in the um, this is really interesting conversation, and we're also keeping our eye out for questions if people have them in the chat. Um, there was a question that uh, someone was asking for you, Dr. Adusa, a little bit earlier about this thing about reproducing consciousness and an African worldview. And um, if we were looking at it from that vantage point, even as we're talking about relationships and families at the micro level, um, this person was asking kind of a reverse question, what does not impact our consciousness? Or is there anything that actually doesn't have that great of effect that maybe we presume does? Maybe we're doing something in repetition that actually doesn't change us. Can you think of anything that doesn't well, have a great well, so here's, the, here's the, the, the challenge. Human, the very nature of the, the very ontological conception of, of beingness presupposes consciousness. So everything in your environment is either impacting your unconsciousness, informing your consciousness, so on and so forth. The question is about here about what reproduces it, right? So, for example, for a fish, the water reprodu- reproduces a certain consciousness in fish, and, and, and that consciousness shifts when you take them out of water. <laughs> like they, 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 their concept of, of what is real and what is not changes when you take them out of the water. So in our society, you know, as Dr. Nobles said, culture is the people as water is the fish. The whole system is reproducing consciousness. So the question for us is, is about how do we develop a, a competing consciousness to deal with the consciousness of the institutions that are uh, re, you know, are, are educating us along the way. And I would say that, 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 that the model that we should be looking at is not necessarily the model of what folks did back on the continent, but looking at the maroon communities. In other words, like how did those, those maroon communities in the, in the, in the swamps and uh, in Louisiana and Mississippi uh, the Quilombos in Brazil and, and uh, uh, Palmares. What? How did they? What kinds of institutions were they able to build that reproduced a certain kind of consciousness so that those maroon societies 
were able to perpetuate themselves decade after decade after decade, oftentimes in the shadow of these plantations, right? Because this is, in some ways, our position here is about almost like guerrilla warfare in a sense. And so those are the questions we should be, we should be asking ourselves. Like, okay, so how, how do we reproduce a certain kind of consciousness in a particular hostile climate? Right. You know, what, 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 is, what is required for us? What is, the, what is the value orientation that we have to adhere to that will allow us to survive and thrive under these circumstances? You know, I, I really understand that. I want to repeat it just for anyone who was listening, if I heard you correctly. The issue is not what's not impacting our consciousness per se, because everything is at some degree is creating a competing consciousness that resists the anti-blackness that we're essentially surrounded by in terms of uh, right. the culture we exist in. Right. right. Reverse right. fuel in a steamboat. Um, right. And that, that that's that's our work too i think sometimes and that's a very large piece of work i think sometimes it's i guess maybe because it's easy to digest people will simplify things and like well if you just had more education or if you just had more money or if you just had the right partner or something like that then your entire reality will alter to benefit you but the reality is that everything you know has to be in an alter state to prepare and anticipate resistance and that's right. another um, with this whole like wave of consciousness or the changing of the times if you will that um, sometimes it seems like unanticipated for some reason and that puts us in a really bad bind I think as a collective um, even beyond the US into the diaspora that you can't be living and articulating in toxic water and then be surprised you know every time someone dies, a fish dies, there has to be something that's continuous and not just um, um, incidentally responsive. Yeah, and those okay. things go back to what you were saying originally when we're talking about institutions, which is the family systems and the religious paradigms you opt into and what you decide to educate your children. And, and you know, and, and and for me, this is this because it, it goes back to a, a value orientation, right? In other words, if you it's your value orientation that determines what what the consciousness of the institution, what kind of consciousness populates an institution that drives it. It's your your value orientation that drives that, right? And so, white misanthropy or what some people call white supremacy is driven by a value orientation. And that value orientation is why 70 million people showed up for Donald Trump, right? That, in other words, like it is the idea of whiteness above all things else, above above capitalism, above religion. Whiteness is the va is the is the central value that drives white misanthropy. And so, it's very clear for folks to make sure that every institution reproduces that consciousness. And for us, we have to have that kind of space where. There is nothing more important than blackness, than a value system that elevates and respects, you know, life itself in its multiple and undulating and unfolding ways of being that invites into the equation the notion of a sacred cosmos in which everything is imbued with life force. Right? But that kind of consciousness has to show up in the institutions we build, in the relationships that we develop. Um, and and to me, this is not a, it's a difficult task, but not a daunting one, right? So every time that I want to, I'm just telling you, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to work on another book or something. My first thing is I always pick out three or four things that I can do really simply to get me started. Because if I focus on the big picture stuff, it ain't going to happen. I'm just going to get discouraged. So I start on small things. And because, you know, the more that I, that I build up momentum for doing the small thing, the more that I get confidence that I can, can take on the bigger things, right? So for me, you know, I had this thing where, I, you know, many years ago, I, I, I thought I was cursing too much. I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm going to stop cursing. But that, but I, I already knew that wasn't going to happen, like, overnight. So I like, so my whole thing was like, okay, look, can I go a whole day without just cussing? Because, you know, for black folks, like, cussing is also about rhythm. It adds rhythm to the speech. It's like it keeps time. So I, so I said, okay, look, I just want to go a whole day. And then when I can do that, I want to go two days, then three days, then a week. 
Then I got to two weeks, then three weeks, then pretty soon I looked up and three months had gone by and I had I wasn't cursing anymore and it wasn't a part of my thing. But I had to start with those with one or two things that I could do well and then build on that. So we can do, you know, you can start with like, you know, a few basic value. What what are some things that you value that are important that you don't think are worth compromising, that you would not compromise on? And just simply try try to go a day without, you know, violating those basic values so that so to me that there are there are things that we can do that over time you know uh i had i was doing my students like this i would say to them you know if i tell you i want you to write a 365 page book in a year almost all my students will bulk but i say look all i want you to do is write me one page a day for a year but i got that right but it's the same thing it's still the same thing it's still it's still a 365 page book at the end of the year but one of them is about breaking it down into elements that are manageable, that the person feels confident they can achieve. And the other one is giving them a task that's so daunting that they don't even want to make the effort. And I think that sometimes in our work, you know, as thinkers, we, we, we do a good job of drawing out the big picture, but we don't give people like the smaller things that will allow them to develop confidence that they can get to the, achieve the, the larger goal. Right. And that's a good point, because I think about that in like little things even in my own life. And so I feel like achieving goals, even though it's constructed as an individual thing, it's also a very collective thing. So like, for example, a lot of women going natural. And I couldn't have done that if I was the only person in my group. Who am I asking questions to? Mm -hmm. Who am I say I look good today? That's not going to work. So things that you're striving to do, you also have to be in community with people who have already done them. And I think that's the best way in terms of changing behavior, like you were saying, as, a, as opposed to just changing attitude. You have to surround yourself with people who are already doing or who have already done the things that you intend to do. And that's a, like a life lesson I took away for all things, work, home, relationships, and everything else. Um, it's very simple advice. Um, but if you're like, well, I want to get into stock market or I want to um, change my appearance, is is like you said. You're not going to gain confidence in, right. in in not having a benchmark and not having someone to be like you need to go more. You need to do this next. There's a blueprint, and so that's kind of something I think, especially in American society, that's a really failing us and failing students. If we want to bring it back to hmm. the college system, is that people get thrown in and they're told do what you love. I think that's so stupid, and I hope it doesn't come off wrong, but. <laughs> You, you know, the, the pathway, there's no pathway um, that people are, you know, acquiring or that they're trained to, to, to seek out. And so even you work in a, um, a black center for students so they can, they have a, a visible thing and people they can come to, to be like, what do I do now? Um, but I know like um, even a lot of resources we, that people have access to, they don't, know about them on campus and they don't they're not trained to seek them out and i think this applies to a lot of things in life um survival um growth expansion um healing all these things we've been talking about yeah so so uh bringing this to to students i always tell um uh my, my undergraduate students that there's two kinds of folks that come to university those who come to the university to be a student and those who come to the university for professional development. The folks who come to the university to be a student, they just taking the classes, they're taking the exams, they're doing, they're, they're on the treadmill doing all of the passes that laid out for them. The folks who are there for professional development are seeking out other opportunities that, it, that enhance their ability to be able to be professionals. And you see this every year as folks get ready to graduate. There's those, there's those folks who already have applied to graduate school or medical school. And there's other folks who are like, yo, I don't know what I'm going to do next. Right. And those are the folks that they, they were great students, but that, but they had a different mentality about how they approach the, the, the work itself. And so I always tell students about your sophomore year, you ought to be thinking about professional development, not just being a student. You right. want to be looking for opportunities that advance you professionally because that's the career, that's the trajectory that you're on. And so oftentimes what happens is that our students come and they, again, they are trained because that, if you're a student, that's your whole goal, be trained. If you, if you think about professional development, you are educating yourself. You're asking yourself, 
okay, what what space do I need to be in that will will allow me to build my career in a certain kind of way? And so part of our job, you know, at the center and other places is to really try and, and reorient folks away from seeing themselves as being trained to see themselves as, as having responsibility for their education and their professional development. So the point you, you're right, like this, so that, you know, cause a lot of folks just end up getting pulled whichever way, right? Like, you know, uh, so at, at Irvine, we have a lot of students who go into biological sciences until they hit, everybody going to be a doctor until they get hit with o organic chem, what we call old chem. <laughs> and then, <laughs> right, and then, and then that, that's what that's what that's what folks all of a sudden decide they want to be a social scientist, right? Or they want to be they want to go into African American studies, right? So again, sometimes the trajectory is you know you're sh is shipped by forces outside of your control, but you still have to think in those spaces. Okay, I'm still about professional development. So if I'm gonna if I'm gonna you know shift from being a doctor to not being a psychologist, I still got to have that mentality about okay. What kind of, you know, what kinds of things I need to know outside of the curriculum itself to be to be a competent professional in this but particular field? I think that shift is really um, important. It's a shift away from the European model that we have that says that everyone who's been a genius and who's invented something worthwhile was some type of maverick or autodidactic person who was like a genius in their own right. Mm -hmm. And even in the ways that we have learned to study even in um, Black studies and Black psychology, we tend to just study the most famous person, but we did not study who was their mother, who mm -hmm. was their best friend, who were their mentors, right? The genealogical history to see how did this person actually come to achieve these things. And so then we falsely assume that if we're something, if we're actually special, then we have to do it all by ourselves. And let me just say this as someone who's... <laughs> Look at all the books back there. It's crazy mm -hmm. how hard. You have to have a community, especially if you're Black, not only because that's culturally aligned, but it's smarter um, in anything you do, whether it's going natural or changing your profession. And I really wholeheartedly stand by that. I think this is really important to piece that into the conversation around collective consciousness and actual development, advancement. Um, yeah. so if you say, this is my favorite artist, or this is my favorite writer, it would be very incumbent upon you to figure out who was their favorite writer mm. or their favorite artist. Yeah, so, so the piece about lineage, you know, or uh, what uh, uh, Kamathi and other folks, you know, kind of like dipping in on Foucault called ge a genealogy is, is important. There's all, so, there's, there's, so there's all of this stuff here that's like really, to me, like sort of, of um, nutrient rich about how we produce uh, a certain kind of consciousness, how we get people to think about things a certain kind of way. And I always think that, you know, you, 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 you move people by offering them examples about things that um, enhance the quality of their, of their life it, that they can see in real time. It's what attracted me to psychology, All right? And so one of the things that, you know, we know is that, you know, going back to this whole thing about, um, thematic a perception is that when people are asked to look at something from a, a a different perspective they invite into the frame more things so for example my mom my mom and her friend her, her sister from church have this ongoing thing about how interracial relationships are destroying the black the black family and it's always it's, my mom lives in an area that's predominantly white but her and her best friend can't see the fact that basically what you're seeing is a function of context, not a function of universal. No, you're in Jackson, Mississippi, or Detroit, or places that are predominantly black. You're still going to see on Saturday nights that the majority of folks at the club trying to holler sisters and brothers, right? And my mom and and, and, and all the census data tells us, right? So people say, like, you know, all these all these black athletes are marrying white women, but the data tells us that about 74% of all black men who are professional athletes and are married are married to black women. Right, so it's not this overwhelming preponderance, right? That that eighty eight percent of of black men who make over a hundred thousand dollars a year or more who are married are married to black women. But if your if your thematic perception has been set such that you only pay attention to the Tiger Woods or you only pay attention to those athletes that are met, that becomes the the organizing framework for everything. So sometimes you know it's important to step back, and and what we call you know interrogate your preferences to ask yourself, why is it that you are seeing what you're seeing as opposed to just accepting that what you're seeing is truth, 
And and that's for all of us, you know, uh, to think, okay, well, what am I, what am I, what am I missing? You know, we had this long conversation at my place about like the whole idea of uh, what is African American culture, right? And we were going back and forth, and it was supposed to be, it was supposed to be a, a short conversation that was went hours, but afterwards, I was like, well, you know, there's some things I need to think about, right? And 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 you know, because maybe I'm thinking about this the wrong way. And I think that that's part of it also, like you know. To, to be in a space where you're reflexive, to be able to, to ask yourself to re-examine something from another perspective, to invite more into the frame. Yes. This has been dope. This is um, Afrocology Lit Series with Dr. Ife and Dr. Adi Sa. And I want to bring us to maybe some closing remarks too um, as we almost out an hour and a half now, because this has been lit, you know, um, and we're trying to offer these conversations um, in the best way possible to find our own experts in Africology and our fields of science where um, Black people are doing the work. So, um, again, Dr. Adisai, can you give people maybe um, maybe how they can find you? This is definitely one of the techniques people often refer to in black psychology where Dr. Adisai himself is one of the authors. Yeah, so uh, email is uh, atunwa at gmail.com or aajamu at uci.edu. Um, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good at responding uh, to email. And if you send me, it can, it can just even be in the subject, hey, like, you know, I, I'd like a copy of the book. I'll, I'll just send it right back to you as a PDF attachment. Um, the the thing that I, I think I want to leave us with is this idea that look, black people are probably over a million years old, and that every African person in this country has in their bloodstream the DNA of the very first people, and blood has memory, and so there is in you a living library of all that has happened before you even came into existence. If you find the way to still yourself and, and find those silent spaces to access that, we call it intuition sometimes, we call it guardian angels. Some of us say it's our ori, but it is still this idea that blood has memory and that we can tap into that. And that while, while black people's persons will die because that's part of the cycle of life, black people are indestructible, right? We're gonna be here, right? The question is about <laughs> But the question about who are we going to be as we're here, not a question of if we're going to be here, but who are we going to be when we're here? And that, and that to me is that to me goes that to me goes to the very question of of character, integrity, and values, right? With because it doesn't it doesn't if we survive, we just we just a mirror image of the folks who have sought to destroy us. We haven't won. We 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 are literally zombies. The question has to be, you know, one, we have been saved. We are still here. The question is, what has God saved us to do? And what will it take for us to actually complete our emancipation? That's 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 the challenge in front of us. Right. That's heavy money right there. We should have paid you for this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I totally agree. Um, and I am Dr. Ife Tayo Flannery. You could just Google that at San Francisco State if you're looking to connect. And the last text I actually wrote and for a very practical reason is because it, there was no text to teach the class that I was, I was hired to teach, which is Introduction to Black Psychology. So that's on the webs. And I'm an alumni of Temple University, so it's my pleasure to be here. Um, so big up to... Um, the people who put this on to Mike Wilson, to all the graduate students at the, in the Africology Department at Temple. Thank you to Dr. Adi Sa, who is my friend and colleague. We keep each other sharp. And to that point, um, I think one of my lasting or lingering comments, I think, for today on this Monday, um, I want to piggyback on this idea of um, not just being woke, but having a shared consciousness and what it means to be in a community with people who share your values to Dr. Adi Sa's point, because that's what actually um, helps you to change your life for the better and to accumulate things that you can actually be proud of. Sometimes in a sort of allegorical way, we've accumulated so much in our life, good and bad, but 
the whole point of destiny and and living um, on this thing you were talking about, basically, for your ancestors, what's in your bloodline, is to leave something behind that's actually worthwhile. And you can't do that by only considering um, yourself and what you can do as one person. And I think when we talk about healing, if we're talking about African psychology, you can't heal without understanding where you came from and your ancestors. Um, sometimes people feel like it starts from where I am now. But if you get diagnosed with diabetes today and you're like, okay, today I have diabetes starting right now, that's not really an accurate picture of your medical history. Mm -hmm. You have had some type of imbalance for so long that now you're diagnosable. Mm -hmm. And so healing yourself is not just, well, I'm starting today. It's really retroactively thinking about the behaviors and the things that you've accumulated um, that have gotten you to a point where you need to change and being able to do that back work and being able to serve as well as to lead. And so, Dr. Adisa, uh -oh. well, we love y'all. We're about to try to save this video and have it posted up. <laughs> you got anything left for us? Uh, all I would just say is look, let's love on each other tenaciously and fiercely. Um, because at the end of the day, we, we all we have, and that's always been true from the beginning of time till now. And um, let's hold each other accountable in love, you know, and in power. Asheo. 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 Thank you.